Again, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to our Workshop Wednesday's webinar series. My name is Ashley Harris. I'm a recruiter within the Office of Human Capital, and I will be the host for today's session. Um, this webinar will be recorded and it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel in a few weeks. A uh, link will be provided by a colleague um, in the chat box there. But also, if you all should have any questions in regards to today's session, um, even if it's in regards to um, specific speakers, please feel free to um, put those questions in the Q&A box that's provided there as well. So we're excited today to highlight four of our operations areas, um, being HR, acquisitions and grants, uh, information technology and finance. But before we get into the specific areas, we just wanna give a brief overview of CMS as a whole, who we are, what we do. So Medicare, Medicaid and the Children's Insurance Health Program I mean, health insurance program, also known as CHIP, and the Federal Insurance Health Exchange is combined, touches over 145 million Americans in this country. And we have about 25 different departments. We're located in 10 regional offices around the country. We're headquartered in Baltimore, Maryland. However, we do have a small office in DC, as well as Bethesda. And we hire a variety of different positions in various fields, being health administration and policy, media and communications, business, finance, and program support, as well as technology, mathematics, and science. So let's get into why we're here today. We do have four panelists that we'll be introducing from those um, listed areas that we mentioned before. First being um, our speaker is Lonnie Giroux from our Director of the Talent Acquisition and Benefits Group within the Office of Human Capital. Thank you, Ashley, and good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, a real pleasure to have this opportunity to talk with you and to share with you a little bit about what we do here at CMS, specifically in the sort of uh, support types of operations. And um, as Ashley said, I'm in the Office of Human Capital, which is um, human resources. And human resources re is really like the people hub of the organization. This is the area that supports all of those employee benefits and you know, really supports the employees in terms of their work life, if you will, in the agency. And so it's really exciting uh, to work in, in this area some specific areas within human resources includes hiring and classification, which I'm the manager of. And so should any of you decide you wanna have a career here at CMS, you would apply through uh, USA Jobs and one of my staff would be, you know, looking at your application and so forth, you know, in terms of that application process. Um, I mentioned uh, classification. Everybody that we have at CMS is on what we call position description, a PD, and we write those PDs and we classify them in terms of the job series and grades. There's also pay and benefits. And, you know, again, people work because they want to get paid. And a lot of people are attracted to federal government due to the benefits that we offer and um, all of those are administered through human resources. Another area in HR is also uh, training and development, which I gotta tell you is sort of my first love. And I'll tell you about that when I talk a little bit about my career. But if you sort of like to teach, teach adults, training and development is a great area um, to use that skill without having to be like in the public school system, right? And um, you can teach soft skills, you can teach more technical skills or leadership development. So that is an area in HR that, that you may possibly be interested in. We do a lot of employee engagement um, activities, such as when we're on site, we have farmer's markets, we have all kinds of, uh, you know, activities for employees to really, you know, feel like they are a part of our organization. Um, also under human resources, 
Um, it falls performance management. You know, everybody who works here is on a performance plan and we help them set goals for them for the year. And we help managers, help employees kind of track how employees are doing against those goals. And then um, sort of the last part of HR that I'll mention is labor and employee relations. So if you are most interested in say like policy and regulations and you're really kind of, your mindset is around rules, um, labor and employee relations might be an area um, for you. Sometimes we have employees who do things that aren't quite what they should do, and typically uh, labor and employee relations will, will get involved to help, again, set employees in, in really the, the right direction. So, again, if you love people and your heart is in uh, serving and helping people and you want to be focused in towards the organization, human resources might be a good spot for you. And I'll just mention one other thing before I talk a little bit about me specifically, and that is what's kind of cool about HR is there's a lot of different areas that focus on different things. And so if you kind of get burnout in one area or you think, ah, I want to try something new, you can sort of stay within HR but try something different. Again, I sort of, you know, started out a lot in training and development, and now I'm managing hiring classification and pay and benefits. So that's a little bit about HR here at CMS. And you might be wondering, you know, well, how did you get there? How did you end up in HR? And um, I started out many years ago with a bachelor's degree in public policy. So government work was always in my heart. I knew that's what I wanted to do. But when I graduated from college, it was during the Reagan administration many years ago, and there was a, a higher increase in federal government. So it was very difficult to get a federal job back then. And so what I ended up doing was I worked for a contractor who did work for the federal government. And I worked for a Medicare Part B contractor. So I started in Medicare early on in my career. I just worked for a contractor as opposed to the federal government. And uh, back then I was basically a walking encyclopedia for, for Medicare. I started out entry level claims processor but I learned all of the ins and outs of, of Medicare. And I'll never forget um, an early experience. Um, our vice president came into my training class. I was, you know, in my 20s. And he said, when you are processing that Medicare claim, you treat that as if that is your grandmother's claim. And I, that has never left me after all of these years. And in HR, when we have issues or problems, I always remember that and think that there's a real person behind that issue. There's a real person behind that piece of paper. There's a real person behind that inquiry. And so throughout my career, I kind of had these little moments, if you will, of really kind of um, a life lesson, and that was one of my first ones in my working career. So one day um, I had somebody approach me, you know, hey, would you like to be a supervisor of training? Knew nothing about training, knew nothing about management, but it was a promotion, so I was like, sure, I'll give that a whirl, I'll give it a try. So that was sort of my second life lesson, and that is don't be afraid to take a risk. Even if it's something that you don't really know much about, you know, step out there, give it a try, and see if that might be something for you. And I gave it a try, and it ended up becoming really a, a love of mine, so much so that I ended up getting a master's degree in what's called instructional and performance technology, which is really instructional design, um, you know, and training and development. And I spent... Um, a number of decades uh, sort of in that world. But that was uh, stepping into HR. That was my first really step in, or excuse me, stepping into training. That was really my first step into HR. And I've been in the HR world ever since then. Um, about that time, Medicare uh, was 
uh, kind of reorganizing contractors, saw the writing on the wall that, um, you know, my time was probably limited there at the contractor. So I ended up actually at that point, then I got a job with CMS, and that was 19 and a half years ago. And I was actually um, a corporate director for that Blue Cross Blue Shield um, contractor, and I ended up coming to CMS as an employee. I wasn't a manager. So that was a really big change for me. Again, wasn't afraid to try something different. Seems like it could have been a, a big step down, but it wasn't very long at all that I ended up um, in a management position again, again, all within the, the, um, the HR world. So um, I just wanted to kind of share that with you. I've been here at CMS 19 and a half years, about 32 years of uh, work uh, behind me. And, uh, you know, so kind of ending up uh, these last few years uh, before I retire. Um, but I would encourage you all to really think heavily about a career working for federal government. It is extremely rewarding. And think about, you know, federal HR. Like, why might you be interested in federal HR? Well, we in HR, we help CMS achieve its mission by bringing in the talent that's needed. If the agency didn't have this talent, it wouldn't be able to accomplish its mission. And so the work we do is extremely important. The other thing is HR work, as you'll hear from all of my other colleagues here on this call, it's transferable to other federal agencies. So you might start out working for CMS, but you say, hey, my family wants to relocate, you know, to California. You can get a federal job in California and all of that experience, all of those, um, leave, the leave, all of that time you put in goes with you. So that can give you, again, a lot of opportunity to try different things. And, uh, you know, it gives you a lot of flexibility. And um, again, with the work that we do, there's a lot of variety to it. So again, I really appreciate this time uh, spending with you. I hope you've uh, gotten at least a little bit about what, um, a little bit of value out of what I had to say. And um, at this point, I'll turn it back over to Ashley. Thank you, Lonnie. Uh, we definitely appreciate you sharing your experience uh, with CMS and just your overall um, you know, personal background. I know you said that you always knew that you were interested in working in the government. Like what sparked that interest for those who may, you know, may be interested in the government world? Yeah, so I got to share with you, it was a teacher I had, I want to say it was in the eighth grade. It was Mr. Smith, Mr. Frank Smith, and it was a civics class. And I don't even know if they teach civics anymore, but it just really spoke to me, you know, um, government work, you know, how that all happens, what we do for our citizens. And um, so it was just really that, the love of that first civics class um, that I had. And again, I, I knew I just always wanted to work for the government. Um, thank you, Lonnie. We do appreciate that. Um, it was great to hear. Um, but next, we do have another panelist, um, Leandra Emanuel. Um, she is the director of the customer relations group within the Office of Acquisitions and Grants Management. Thank you, Ashley. Um, my area of, at CMS is the Office of Acquisition and Grants Management, and it's a lot of words and a lot of our acronym as far as what you know what we do, but basically in office acquisition and grants management, we're like OHC, Office of Human Capital, I feel like we're kind of the hub. Nothing happens at CMS unless it goes through us. The majority of the work that is done at CMS is contracted out. A lot of the support service, a lot of the services we provide is contracted out. And then that, that cannot happen without a contract. So in the office of acquisition and grants management, we handle contracts, we also handle discretionary grants, and we also do interagency agreements. So contracts, think of a contract as the tool of, 
or mechanism we use to contract out services that we need to support the Medicare Medicare program. And as far as the discretionary grants, think of it as a type of contract, but not necessarily the same way where we get money that we provide to universities and organization to support Medicare, Medicaid. And the interagency agreements, think of it as a mechanism we use to work between government agencies to get work done. So those are the three buckets that we support, but all of that is done to support the CMS mission. So I always say that without us, the Arkansas Grants Office, nothing will happen at CMS. We have an important role even though we're a small office, we do have an important role in the organization. Um, just to let you understand the magnitude, we have about 200 or so staff members, but in one year, like last fiscal year, we processed over 4,000 contract actions, meaning contract action grants and interagency agreements, and we actually spent a total of about $10 billion. So that's a lot of money in one year and with a small staff. So that's why when people ask me at OEGM, I would say nothing happens at CMS unless it goes through OEGM. So I feel like our office has a lot to offer and a lot in terms of being able to support CMS's mission. The majority of our staff in the Acquisition and Grants office are mostly contracting officers, contracting specialists. And if you are familiar with you know, job series, that's the 1102 job series. And I'll spend a little bit of time of talking about the job series a little bit, because a lot of times, you know, people do may not understand what it is that we do and what is 1102, what that means. But I will say to you, for me, I think, and I'm probably going to be biased, I think it's one of the most exciting, um, challenging, and dynamic fields in government. And a lot of the skills you learn is transferable everywhere you go because of the, the things you get to learn um, as a 1102. So 1102 is a contracting officer contract specialist. And that is a professional, considered professional business field where it allows you to be able to um, get extensive training and job experience in negotiating contracts, doing, um, views of proposals, looking at proposals from vendors and making sure that the government is getting the best deal through your negotiations with them. Also, it allows you to get training on the Federal Acquisition Regulation where you learn the rules of how to be able to put these contracts together. It also allows you to, you know, learn about government accounting, how you um, account for, you know, the expenses that you are going to, um, you know, bind the government with. And it also provides you the ability to learn about business law. And there's a lot of laws and things that we have to also take in consideration as you enter into these contracts. So contracts are a binding agreement you have with the outside to get work done. So all of these come to place. So when you look at the training and a lot of the um, experience that you get as a 1102, these are transferable inside and outside of the government. But I but it's important for you to know that it is a professional field and there are some classes and training you have to take. And once you come on board, we do provide you the necessary training and, 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 and equipment and tools that you need to be able to do the job. So the first step is a contract specialist. We bring you in, you learn the different um, skill sets you need, and then you're able to get some on the job training from there, if you're interested in the field, you can move into being a contracting officer. And the contracting officer is the next level up. That's the person who actually signs the contracts and actually binds the government. So that level, you need an, a, a, what's called a warrant where you would have to have a document certifying that you have met the requirements, you have the experience needed to take that next step for you are able to bind the government. So that's where you get a contract as officer warrant. And the next step is if you are liking the field, you do have the opportunity to become manager. And that's where I come in. I am actually, and just to give you a little bit of background of me, I started off as a, a contract specialist, I became a manager and then I became a contracting officer and a manager. I am no longer um, in the, particularly in the acquisition field per se. I actually moved to be a, uh, um, the customer relations group director. But before that, I was actually the information technology group director where I handle all the information technology contracts in CMS. So 
for me, um, you know, there is progression in the field. You don't have to stay in one place. For me, I moved out of that area. I'm still part of the contracting shop, but I do support the customer relations side of the office where it's more of the internal operations of the office, helping the office run is what I do now. Another aspect of the job at CMS is, as I said, um, the grants management part. Like the contracting series, it's a professional series. The focus here though is at the administration of the grants that uh, cooperative agreements that the agency manages. So like the 1102, the grants management specialist is more like the contract specialist and you have a grants manager that also handles the, um, the signing of the grants documentation. And with that field, you also can move into management. So in all of these fields, you can move into management as you progress on. Um, I do feel that it's one of those fields where you can start from the very bottom and you know, move up to management. With time, with training, you can do that. One of the things that we do as far as when we're looking at people for this job is looking at people who have skills, analytical skills, customer service, because a lot of the work you are going to be doing in acquisitions and grant is working with internal customers and external and, and, and internal um, program offices, and of course, dealing with contractors externally. So customer service and having that ability to talk and, 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 and partner and collaborate is very important. So when we're looking at candidates, we wanna make sure that that customer service aspect of your, of, of your um, experience is, is there. And um, of course, analytical skills is important because you are reviewing a lot of documentation as far as proposals, you're writing contracts. We wanna make sure you be able to analyze doc information and be able to synthesize it and make sense of things. So we probably look at that, we look at that also too. And as far as planning, you have to be organized in this field to be able to be successful. There's a lot of issues, a lot of things that comes with issuing that much money on the government half. So there's a lot of planning, coordinating and, and things you need to do. So we make sure that when we look at candidates, they have the proper um, planning, um, you know, organizational skills in their resumes. And the biggest thing for us to is being able to communicate. Because one of the part of our job is being able to communicate. We spend a lot of time meeting, planning and communicating. And so you have to be able to be comfortable communicating, not just in writing, but also verbally. That's part of the job. And so we, this is what we look for in candidates for both the contracting field and the grants field. Um, I'll step back a little bit to talk about how did I get here? Um, I had kind of stumbled into the field. Um, um, Lori mentioned that she wanted to be a, a federal employee. Uh, not so much. In high school, when you asked me what I was going to be, I was going to be a corporate attorney. <laughs> and I went to college and I said, oh, I don't think I want to do law anymore. So I went into the business field. I thought I want to be an accountant. And then got into it, don't like accounting as much. So I ended up getting it. So a regular business administration degree. And so part of my summers while in school, I worked at Redstone Arsenal, which is in Huntsville, Alabama, as a summer intern. So I got to see what the federal career looked like, and it wasn't too bad. And so when I graduated um, from college, I had the opportunity to work at the um, Department of Energy as a management analyst. And the job there was pretty, uh, what I would say, Pretty exciting. It was around a time where the internet was the biggest thing ever. It was called the information superhighway. A lot of you probably don't know, even can read uh, me on the center time where the internet was actually the biggest thing ever. It's like you know, normal for you, but for us then it was the biggest thing. And my job as a recent college grad was that we were taking paper publications and making available on the web. That was my job, working on coordinating to get those things on the web. And love the job, exciting, fun. And then you probably heard this before, you know, we have a continued resolution when a government cannot fund their um, pay the bill and, or we haven't passed a budget, we have a CR and people get to, you know, get to ha probably have to get um, furloughed and things like that. So two years, a year and a half into that job, 
um, you know, there was this, uh, um, the government shutdown. And when we came back, our budget got cut. So I was one of the new people. So I figured I figured I'd probably next time that happened, I'd probably be laid off. And then so a friend of mine said, hey, there's this new career field. It's 1102. It was not it's now a professional field where you need a bachelor's degree to do the job. And they're looking for research college grad with good with when you have to have a 3.5 GPA. And if you send your resume in and you look good, they'll hire you. So I sent my resume off to a fax. Back then we had fax. Fax my resume off to Texas and I went away. I got a call and it's like, you're hired and you're moving to um, Huntsville, Alabama. And I was like, okay, um, what's the job? It's 1102, what do you do? Oh, you'll find out. And that was it. I became 1102 <laughs> and I, we were in at, and I was working at the Army Missile Command in, in Huntsville, Alabama. And we had um, um, like a, it was like a two year program where you had the training, you went away, did the classes, you had on the job training. And I will say, and I won't tell you how long ago that was, it was a very long time ago. And I would say once I got into it, I realized a lot of the skills I had as a business student transferred and I ended up loving the field. I really started learning a lot and it became one of those things where I always tell people, contracting is a job where it's never the same. Every day is a different issue. Every day is a, a different learning lesson. And it can be chaotic at a time. We go from September to um, October to September. So from June to September, life is pretty chaotic because you have to spend all your money. And a lot of times, a lot of the programs wait till the fourth quarter to really decide what they want to do. So as 11 or two, you're spending a lot of your time in those three months trying to spend or, you know, come into these agreements or contracting agreements with your program office support, whatever program. So that little three month period is very hectic. And I always tell folks, if you like a little about chaos in your life, if you like a little bit of disarray, it's a perfect feel for you because it's very hectic and it's not for the faint of heart. You have to be willing to be able to juggle many multiple things at, at one time and you have to be able to think fast and be able to move. And if that's your skill set, you'll do very well in this field. I have been at CMS for now for about 18 years and I did work for DOD and I moved to the, um, I worked for the defense side and I moved to the um, civilian side of contracting. I will say, and the civilian side is less, it's lean, more lenient than the DOD side. And I will say to you that we do have a lot more leave work is not as structured, but the one thing I do like about is that it gives you the, up, the, the ability to be more flexible in terms of being able to support the, the mission and being able to get things done. Um, I will say for me, it's been a very rewarding career field. Um, I have grown from, as I said, from being a specialist to a contracting officer and to now being a, a group director, uh, being in management. And I still do touch acquisition, just not as much as I did in the past. And for us, as um, 1102s, I will say, if you ask any contracting officer, they will probably say the same thing. It's a hard, challenging job, but it's one of the most rewarding jobs because it's one of the few places I know of that I have a few career fields where you actually see at the end of the day, your impact to um, you know, the beneficiaries. You actually have a tangible thing. You can say, this is what I worked on. This is what I produced at the end of this five or six months of going back and forth with vendors or negotiating. There's actual you know, like artifacts. Sometimes in the jobs, it may, it may be hard to quantify. That's one of the jobs. So you can actually have something you can say, hey, this is what I accomplished. Or you can say, I started here with this milestone at the end of the day, this is what I accomplished. So I will say to you, if this is something you would like to do, if, if you like challenges and you like a career where you can actually, I mean, a, a career field where you can actually see an end product, I would say that's something you can consider. And I will turn it back over to Ashley. Thank you so much, Leandra, um, for your experience and definitely, you know, giving a lot of good advice uh, for those out here that may be interested and maybe even a new career path or that realm specifically. 
But for those who may be, would you say that if someone was interested in becoming a contract specialist, that's a career they could obtain through maybe certifications and training alone, or should they be in a specific realm and a major? I know you said you had business as a background that was very tangible. I mean, transferable. Mm -hmm. Um, But would you say they should have like a specific area that they should study to maybe lead themselves in this direction or combination? So combination. So we look for um, one of the things to move up initially coming through the door. You don't have to be a business major. You can be different major. We've had a lot of people um, recently who were actually school teachers. You know, the one thing that we do ask for, and it's part of it's part of the career field. You have to have at least twenty four hours of business, and that's the one thing you have to have twenty four hours. Some people start, and then if they want to get to the higher level um, to get their warrant, they go back to school and you know get the, the twenty four business credits that you need. But no, you don't have to you know be a, a business major. You can be a history major education major. It's just that if you want to move to the contracting officer level to get a warrant or move to a certain grade level, you have to have the 24 hours of business, but that shouldn't be a hindrance for you. We had a lot of attorneys too. Um, if you're an attorney, that's a good transferable um, skill set um, because again, you're an- analyzing you know, legal documents, you're looking at things, and there is um, the Federal Acquisition Regulation, which is our Bible that has a lot of regulations and things. So if you have that mindset too, that that transfers a lot too. Perfect. Well, thank you again, Leandra. I'm sure the, that advice and um, the information you provided will definitely be helpful to someone that's on this session today. Um, but our next speaker that we do have, um, we have Mark O. From He's the Director of the Infrastructure and User Services Group within the Office of Information Technology. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, I would totally agree with uh, Leandra and Lonnie that they are definitely the hub. We uh, rely and depend on on, on both uh, Lonnie and Leandra's support uh, always. I would disagree with them or maybe a little bit of competition uh, about the excitement. Uh, I I think uh, Office of Information Technology, uh, we are the exciting office uh, in the agency and and most innovative. So we can argue about that, uh, continuing to do so. Uh, So Office of Information Technology, we are uh, operations and support organization. We um, help execute uh, CMS mission tasks and workflow through uh, managing the application and system development and data and information. When you think about CMS and how CMS supports around 150 million Medicare, Medicaid, and insurance coverage beneficiaries, that is a huge task that all of us take very seriously. So with that in mind, let me describe what Office of Information Technology looks like. We are Um, In multiple work streams, Uh, in one, uh, we provide enterprise architecture. Uh, So from IT perspective, uh, the technical architecture and uh, business uh, intelligence and things of that nature. Another group within uh, IT focuses on agencies, IT and capital planning, working closely with um, OAGM and OFM, our financial management. And then uh, the, there are key uh, application development areas that support Medicare systems, Medicaid systems, and marketplace systems, as well as internally looking uh, applications like SharePoint, the enterprise identity. We have huge emphasis on information and, and cybersecurity. Across the board, I think we, um, We are an organization of around 500 uh, people, uh, majority being IT specialists, uh, focusing on on, on helping manage um, applications running on on Amazon Web Services. In fact, CMS has one of the largest footprint in cloud computing of all the uh, federal agencies outside of uh, military and intelligence. We are probably one of the largest uh, agencies out there. That that also signifies how CMS is being innovative when we are looking at whether um, running Python on AWS or uh, or developing artificial intelligence or machine learning, uh, or even working on a mainframe uh, using COBOL, 
Uh, if you're not familiar with IT, a lot of that was gobbledygook, but if you are in IT, all of that probably made sense. So, so come talk to me. <laughs> if it made sense to you, come talk to me, <laughs> right? Uh, but kidding aside, I think um, uh, from uh, Office of Information Technology perspective, we, again, take our operations and support role very seriously. We recognize that we are, are part of an uh, engine that makes uh, the policies and the execution of those policies happen so that people can be qualified for um, uh, their healthcare coverage and get the payments so that, that they can get the care that they need. So how I started, um, it, it's, it's, it's funny how everybody, I think, has a, a very different um, start and how they ended up at CMS. Um, so I, prior to CMS, I was an uh, engineer and strategic management consultant, um, doing a lot of traveling, uh, kind of enjoying that consulting world, if you will. Um, I've been at CMS for about 10 years, and I joined purposefully to help implement Obamacare. Uh, for me, that was a personal call, personal call, calling. Um, you know, uh, my family members had pre-existing condition. You know, so uh, so the um, prior to Obamacare, if you didn't, if you had pre-existing condition and you were not covered through Medicare or things of that nature, it was a scary time because there would be no healthcare coverage for you, right? So I wanted to join and make a difference. And wow, what a different, um, uh, what a great ride I, I, I was uh, part of. And it was, I think, to Leandro's point, it's not always easy, right? I, and um, looking back, uh, I, I think it was, uh, I was glad that it was not easy. It was not meant to be easy. It was meant to attract those that are passionate, those that really care, those that want to make a difference. And I'm really glad I'm part of CMS who are out there every day uh, supporting and delivering uh, services to those 150 million plus people. So I never intended to stay <laughs> uh, at CMS. I figured I would be uh, part of Obamacare um, uh, deployment, maybe three, four years, and I'm out of here, go back to the consulting world. Um, Life happens, I guess, and I fell in love with CMS and the, the passionate people that CMS has. And, uh, and I was able to identify uh, opportunities that needed my service. So um, that's what kept me going at CMS. Uh, there are always opportunities uh, to, um, to um, further your, your service. Uh, to, again, uh, coming back to supporting and servicing those 150 million U.S. Uh, people that uh, are in need of our, our service. Currently within um, Office of Information Technology, we do have multiple opportunities, whether you are looking for IT operations or cloud computing or cybersecurity is another big emphasis and area, or you are a, a technical uh, management. Right, and in multiple of those um, categories, we have multiple opportunities. So definitely uh, looking forward to people reaching out um, and, uh, and seeing and engaging uh, with those individuals. Um, we recently had an opportunity to attend a virtual uh, career fair uh, with the uh, Veterans Administration. And again, opportunities like this, and we found some great people, so I'm hoping we um, also uh, get similar type of experience uh, with regards to the engagement, as well as uh, identifying and, and, and being attracted to um, some really good ca candidates uh, through these type of sessions as well. Ashley, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mark. Appreciate that. Um, I know you said you did um, a lot of, you had consulting uh, and engineering experience beforehand and the Obamacare specifically led you to uh, CMS, but do you, what would you say really kept you here, I guess, per se, outside of your work? Like, would you say the atmosphere, the culture, you know, because it, 
it does take a lot to stay within one agency, especially in the government, you know, you can move around. So what really kept you at CMS? A great question, because when you are in the consulting world, I think I was switching jobs every two years, right? Literally, whoever offered me higher pay, I was willing to switch, right? So that's, and that's a life of a strategic management consultant, right? What's been different about CMS is the people, right? It, it really energizes you because you are working with really passionate people that are so mission oriented and mission focused that, um, that I've never seen uh, that type of focus and dedication. It really inspires you to um, do something greater, right? So uh, not about chasing the money, right? And, and federal government, I think, pays really well, right? Um, maybe not compared to the, the consulting role, but uh, the, the trade-off, what I got out of, uh, of being part of CMS is working with great people, working on innovative uh, policy executions, and particularly in the realm of the IT, it allowed me to focus and tackle some pretty hard IT challenges, uh, and, but not uh, on my own, but with a group of folks that were ju just as dedicated as I was on that singular focus of accomplishing that mission. That, that group mentality, that collaboration, and that community was something that I just could not give up. Thank you, Mark. We appreciate that. So um, our guests today can, you know, really understand the CMS culture and, you know, what drew, drew everyone here and why they are still here. So thank you for that. Um, our final speaker today, we do have Latasia Lance. Um, oh my gosh, sorry about that. I sorry, I just had a glitch on my screen. Um, so yes, again, we have Latasia Lance today. We have from the Deputy Director of the Accounting Management Group within the Office of Financial Management. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Ashley stated, my name is Latasia Lance. Um, everyone calls me Tay, um, and I'm with the Office of Financial Management. Um, so the Office of Office of Financial Management, um, like everyone else has said. Uh, I would say without us, I don't think there's too much, too much that can actually get done within, uh, within CMS because we're responsible for making sure the funds get out the door. Um, so we support the agency's overall mission by ensuring we are effective stewards of the $2 trillion, and that's with a T, $2 trillion of public funds that are entrusted to CMS. Um, there are five groups with a total of 25 divisions that support this work. And it is definitely a lot of work and it varies across each uh, particular group and division. Um, so the groups are, we have a payment accuracy and reporting group and they oversee the uh, agency's annual and proper payment measurements for our Medicare fee-for-service program, uh, Medicaid and CHIP programs, uh, Medicare Part C and, and Part D programs. Uh, we have the financial services group and they are responsible for establishing policies and procedures to coordinate benefits, authorize payments. Uh, they perform audits, collect debts, uh, and negotiate settlements um, in order to protect the, uh, what, we, uh, what a lot of our money comes from for, our part, for Medicare, um, our healthcare trust funds. Uh, then we also have our financial management systems group, and they are responsible for managing, operating, and maintaining uh, the major financial systems that supports CMS's financial management. So they will develop um, IT systems, um, support accounting operations, um, we'll do, they'll you know, do system changes for our accounting system and those other systems that OFM uses um, in order to make payments. Uh, then we have the budget and analysis group and they serve as our external liaisons and internal coordinators for all of CMS's budgetary activities. So every office center uh, within CMS um, has to deal with uh, our budget and accounting, budget and analysis group, uh, because they are responsible for letting everyone know how much money they have to spend to, for, their, for their various programs. And they'll also formulate the budgets for um, the overall agency budget and provide guidance and policies to make sure that the budget is being um, used accordingly. 
Uh, the last group within OFM is the accounting management group, and that is the group that I'm the de deputy director of. And we are actually one of the largest groups uh, with almost 100 employees and like across seven divisions. Um, so we are responsible for a multitude of accounting operations. Um, at a high level, we process accounting transactions for all of the agency's operations. So uh, to, to kind of relate it to what everyone else has talked about, we process all the contract payments, we process employees' payroll, we process um, you know, any IT contracts, all of that comes through um, the accounting management group. We collect payments, we bill for Medicare premiums, we coordinate and test system changes for our accounting system, we provide financial reporting and oversight of what are called Medicare administrative contractors, and those are the contractors that process Medicare claims. They used to have another name way back when, but uh, we now refer to them as MACs. We are responsible for the agency's uh, A123 process, which is basically an overview of CMS's internal controls. We prepare and issue CMS's financial statements and do other required financial reporting, including producing um, the agency's annual financial report and um, as a result of the um, Chief Financial Officer's annual audit. And we oversee the travel policy and, and travel operations for CMS. So it's a lot that goes on in this one little group. So you can imagine if this much goes on, and this is just high level, this is really everything that we do. You can imagine some what goes on in some of the other groups as well. Um, I've been at CMS for over 20 years, and I have spent my entire time within this one particular group. Um, and although, although the group has, has changed many, many, many times, um, has been you know, somewhat different over the years, but I've been in this one particular group uh, for, for over 20 years. Um, I actually started out as an auditor for the state of Maryland um, right after graduating with an accounting degree from Morgan State University. Um, my time as an auditor was great. Um, I obtained my certified public accounting license I moved up quickly to become a senior auditor. We have had direction of um, audits and staff assigned to the audit. And after being there for about five years, an opportunity came up at CMS to develop the financial reports along with the financial reporting policies and procedures for the contractors that process Medicare claims. At that time, CMS did not have anything in place and it was actually a material weakness in the audit finding. So the idea of building that accounting infrastructure from the ground up was extremely intriguing. Um, I was ecstatic when I got the job offer and thus my career as an accountant at CMS uh, began. Uh, I'm proud to say that that team I was assigned to at that time, we did resolve the material weakness and completed the task of developing those financial reports and policies and procedures, which structurally are still in use to this day. Uh, and being part of that team allowed me to travel to many places throughout the U.S. and Puerto Rico to provide instruction on how to implement the financial policies and procedures, as well as to ensure they were properly implemented and op operationalized at the Medicaid contract locations. Back then, we had about 50 uh, Medicare contractors. Um, now, with system enhancements and consolidations, we're down to a probably a good Mm, 12 or I'll say a good close to 20 maybe um make it's probably even further than that if we just consider um what we call the what we call the uh the max there are only 12 of those and then after being on that team for a number of years I became what was what, what we still an accountant position but I was the CFO audit liaison and so in that role I oversaw CMS's financial statement audit process and worked with the office of inspector general and their external audit firm to ensure that CMS's audit was completed um, by the government-wide due date. That was probably my favorite job that I ever had here at CMS uh, because I was able to learn a lot about CMS's processes outside of accounting because I worked with numerous of all the other program offices within CMS to make sure that they had policies and procedures in place um, and was providing certain information to the external audit firms. And from there, um, that experience being the CFO audit liaison moved me into management and I became the director 
uh, for what is now known as the, as the Division of Financial Reporting and Policy. Initially, when I became the director, it had a different name. Um, there was a, a deputy director. We had like 25 employees. And not only were we, were we, were we preparing the agency's quarterly financial statements, and even back then, it was still trillions of dollars. <laughs> it was still at least a trillion dollars. Um, it's, it has almost doubled in probably like the last five years, uh, but we've over, you know, we was overseeing the CFO audit. We were overseeing the A123 process, uh, with the financial reporting of the Medicaid contractors. It was just a lot of competing priorities. So luckily for me, the event, the, the division was eventually pared down to half the employees that focused on uh, preparing CMS's quarterly statements and the other requirement government financial reporting that we do. And then that role as the director of the division led to my current role, which is uh, the deputy director of the accounting management group. And I would say for anyone that's looking to be an accountant um, within or within the Office of Financial Management, because most of, most of the uh, job series are accountants or financial management specialists, I do believe we have some um, health insurance specialists as well as some maybe a few system account accountant accounting. Um, series, but mostly it's, you know, being able to uh, analyze. Um, I think that is, and, and showing that you can analyze. I think that's one of the, the biggest um, pieces to, to being an accountant with an agency of this size. It's just being able to truly understand and, and being, uh, I would say, curious about, you know, where these transactions originating, you know, what is causing, you know, well, what's causing this issue that we have here? You know, how can we resolve this issue? So that, and then just being able to collaborate with others. Um, I, I, I guess it's kind of funny because most of the, I would say most of the staff within, at least for the accounting management group, you know, we have very little turnover. Um, we've had a few um, vacancy announcements out there. We recently just had one for um, the recent grad program, but a lot of individuals, um, when we when they do decide to leave OFM, they go to another area within CMS <laughs> uh, because you know because those other offices or or uh, centers you know need someone with the background knowledge of how the accounting side of this works so that they can make sure that they're putting pro uh, front processes in place that will work on the back end you know to make sure there are no glitches with payments or um, to make sure that they're in line with you know, uh, with financial policies and, and, you know, that won't result in any audit findings or anything like that, or, you know, someone that understands budget or someone that understands, you know, how improper payments work so that they can make sure that their program is set up to ensure that, you know, payments are going out the door correctly the first time. So it's definitely, obviously, an exciting area. Um, I guess I haven't been bored if I've been in the same, uh, uh, before coming to the group level, I mean, I was in the same division for uh, for probably uh, 15 years, 15, 16 years, um, but the division just changed uh, in regards to the type of work that we did and then just with different, um, you know, mandates that will come down from treasury and, and places like that on things that we need to try to implement and change. It's it's always ever changing. I, I can't. I can't really say there's been a year where we were like, "Ooh, nothing to do." No, we always have some sort of change that we have to make. So, it's, it's definitely been an exciting time, and um, and I'm sure more excitement to come with, you know, with with the way technology moves and, and requires us to kind of move with it. Back to you, Ashley. Thank you, Tasia for all of the um, you know, guidance and just explaining your entire group as a whole and your component. Um, but someone that would maybe on this session that's interested in becoming an auditor, um, you know, what advice or like skills do you think would be most you know, pertinent for someone that's pursuing something like that? Um, I think it's definitely important for that person to be um, flexible. Um, they definitely have to have people skills. Uh, and when I say people skills, you kind of have, you have to be someone that's, you know, willing to talk to, talk to others, to get information, to get people to talk to you about what it is that, um, you know, that they're trying to do or what they, what it is that they're, yeah, what it is that they're trying to do. Uh, because a lot of times 
let's say when, even though we're in accounting, uh, we I'll use uh, Mark's example, marketplace for an, for an example, we actually, we had to sit with the program, you know, program people to say, you know, how do you, how do you want to see this program work? And how, depending on how you want to see it work, will determine, you know, um, what we can tell you from an accounting standpoint of what you need to do to get payments out the door, what you may need to do, you know, what system changes you may need, or, you know, are you working with a contractor and, you know, have you already involved OEGM to get your contract set up? You know, how do you plan to pay this contractor? Um, what monies are you using for this? So it, it's, it's, you know, you kind of almost have to be a, I would say a researcher <laughs> at some points, um, you know, to, to kind of draw the information out of individuals, uh, you know, sort of, and then being able to collaborate to get to a to a, um, an agreement that everyone is happy with, because, you know, they may say, we want the program to run this way. And we'll say, well, we can't really get it to run this way because we have these limitations. You know, you have to have that kind of give and take and be able to, you know, kind of negotiate negotiation skills, uh, kind of negotiate, you know, where, uh, where the middle ground is. All great skills indeed, for sure. But thank you again. Yeah. Um, so at this time, everyone, all of our speakers have given their experience and personal backgrounds. We want to take a time to at least um, have the attendees be able to have their questions answered that weren't answered already. So um, are there any questions, Marla? In the yeah, so we have a few questions um, for all of our speakers. So I know we're nearing the one o'clock mark. If everybody has a few more minutes. Um, that would be amazing. Um, so Lonnie, I will start with you. We had a question come in um, from one of our attendees and this person asked, can you please share more about the performance plan, about how the performance plan is used to support employees and assess performance? Right, sure, I'm happy to answer that. And uh, the performance plan is based on your position description. Remember, I talked about that um, a little bit. Every employee has that. And the performance plan is an annual plan. So it, it usually contains five to six what we call elements. And these are the things that, you know, um, your manager wants you to focus on in the upcoming year. And that's what you will be evaluated against in terms of, you know, your performance. And so it's very specific. We use what we call SMART goals. They're specific, measurable, attainable, attainable, relevant, and timely. That's a SMART goal. And they're all related to the job that you do. And so you periodically meet with your manager. You pull out your PMAP to say, here's what my goals are. Your manager gives you feedback on how you're doing. And you have like two what I'll call formal ratings. One is at the six month mark, so usually around the June, July timeframe, and then the end of year. And you can actually receive a performance award based on how well you do against those goals. And it's usually, right now we have like a five tier rating. And if you get outstanding, which is the highest uh, rating, you know, typically you are then eligible for a performance award for the year. Awesome, thank you for that, Lonnie. That's a great, a great recap of um, how we rate performance here. Um, so I had two questions come in for Mark. Um, so one was kind of a general question. Somebody asked, are there entry level opportunities um, for IT specialists uh, that might have a business admin degree? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, that reminds me, one of the best developer that I have ever worked with, uh, this was when I was working for uh, McKesson. Um, uh, he used to be an elementary school teacher, right? And then he uh, got into IT and, and just became one of the world-class uh, developer. And one of the, um, Definitely my mentor and, and technologist, best technologist that I have ever worked with, had, had a uh, economics uh, degree coming out, out of, of school, right? So uh, I think business administration, uh, whether it's business administration or others, uh, really is not a barrier to coming into uh, IT. There are definitely opportunities. Awesome, thanks, that's helpful. And then one more question, I 
believe this is IT related. <laughs> um, I forgive my ignorance here. Um, so somebody had a question about, do we have departments where employees use machine learning algorithms specifically using Pythons? That's IT. Yeah, so not just limited to Python. Uh, obviously Python, We, uh, if you're in IT, uh, you utilize Python quite a bit, uh, especially in uh, AWS and Microsoft Azure regards to cloud computing. Um, but uh, we use Python for uh, many other uh, purposes and machine learning. I think that uh, has been a buzzword uh, within IT industry for a number of years. Uh, so that's been part of uh, part of innovation that CMS uh, has been pursuing from the uh, IT perspective, along with uh, artificial intelligence and, and data lake and, and all kinds of things. CMS is quite innovative and we're not at the bleeding edge, but we're at the leading edge of uh, the IT. Thank you, that's very helpful. Um, and then lastly for Leandra, I think Leticia, you might be off the hook here. Um, for Leandra, um, there were two questions that came in regarding um, the contracting field. So one is a question actually we get kind of often as recruiters. Do you know if there is a resource um, that kind of lists out the contractors that CMS contracts with and, and how to contact them? Um. I don't know that we have a published list of all of our contractors that we can share um, publicly. I know internally we have things, but I don't, I don't, I'm not aware of something publicly that people can go to and see our list of contractors. Um, Great, thank you for that. We actually get that question pretty, pretty often. <laughs> it would be um, nice, but I don't know that's something that we can keep up with, you know, because yeah, our contractors can... change all the time too. For different Absolutely, things. I can imagine. Um, and then I believe you mentioned some potential um, contract specialist 1102 positions that might be coming up. And we had an a audience member ask, uh, when do we think those uh, vacancies will be coming up for OAGM? So the two most recent ones, we had a 7 9 and a 1112. They just closed um, last month. Um, so, but every, almost like every, um, every time someone leaves, we, we, we would, you know, Put something out so usually from the that from this one just closing usually it's like a 90 day i think time period where you can we have to wait to post another one so i would say like well probably maybe 90 days or so if we have vacancies we would post um a direct hire i think at the um at the um 11 12 and then we have a regular one at the 7 9 so i would say probably next year probably march february march if anyone's leaving we do that um, post something, but the, 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 the last two just closed. Um, just thank you for that. Um, <laughs> no, thank you. That, that's very helpful. Um, and Ashley, that does it for our questions. So you guys did a fantastic job. I will turn it back to Ashley. Thank you. All right. Great. Thank you. Um, so now we're actually going to launch a poll for all of our attendees that have um, attended this session today, just to see, get any feedback of the session itself. Um, if you all could do that for us. It will take just a couple seconds. And then while everyone's still filling this uh, poll out, we do want to thank everyone that attended today, all of the attendees, as well as the speakers that took time out of your busy schedules to attend this hour uh, webinar today. We appreciate it. As well as a reminder to all of those that pre-registered, there will be a follow-up email that will be sent out to you um, in regards to this session, as well as the video of this recording will be posted on our YouTube channel in a few weeks. And this is the final webinar of 2021 for our workshop. Um, webinar series. So we do thank everyone that attended, as well as those that have attended multiple sessions this year as well. And just a reminder to um, be aware that we are going to, uh, on our website, we're going to have more information about the 2022 webinar series that will be beginning in March. And you should have some more information around January. So that's just an update on that. And again, we hope everyone has a great holiday season ahead. Thank you. Thank you. And the polling has been done, so thanks. <laughs>